Okay. My name is Carol Minkiti, and I'm the wife of Ifani Minkitu, who passed away almost two years ago, who was just ecstatic about this store, <laughs> as we are too. And so now my children and I own the store, and I want to welcome you for being here. It hasn't been long that we've been able to have people in the store, and it means a lot to the readers because the ambience of the store is so important to the reading. And um, I also want to welcome the people that are on Zoom because there are quite a few people on Zoom. And uh, they have the privilege of seeing the face of the poet up close, which is nice. <laughs> but you have even more uh, privileges as well. So welcome. And uh, I know you'll enjoy this wonderful reading tonight. Thank you for being here. And thank you for being here. <laughs> Fiona. <laughs> Fiona is an intern here, and she has been from the beginning of the school year, and she's going to introduce the poets. So this is Fiona right here. Hi, my name is Fiona. I'll be doing introductions tonight. So the first person that will be reading for us tonight is Susan Barba um, from Churchim's nursery rhymes and lullabies to her grandfather reciting Armenian poetry to her by heart. Susan has been interacting with poetry since she was quite young. She was captivated by the music of poetry and learned to fall in love with a form that allows her to express the thoughts that ordinary language cannot. Now, Susan Barba is the author of two of her own poetry books her first collection, Fair Sun, which came out in 2017, was awarded the Anahid Literary Prize and the Minas and Colher Tolian Prize. Her second collection, Geode, was a finalist for the New England Book Awards. She has received fellowships from McDowell and Yaddo. Susan now works as a senior editor for the New York Review of Books. All right, how's this? Hi, everyone. <laughs> and hello, everyone here. Um, <clears throat> see, let me find a place for all my props. Unmask. Thank you all so much for coming. This is so exciting. I haven't been in person for a reading. Uh, since before COVID. So this is really special. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you, especially to Carol for inviting me. All right, so I'm gonna start, can you hear me all right? I'm gonna start with two new poems and um, see what we have time for. I might read more than that. here. Okay, this is called Ankle Deep in the Dandelions. They've bloomed, the milk rising in their stiff stems into their yellow heads. Hallelujah. Here we go into the blue. One woman with her fist full of lilac, one man with his hand round a bottleneck, her mask a necklace, his pocketed, they skirt together, apart, dodging the obstacles. They've worried the beads enough. They've hurried the rosary. They've scrolled and clicked their way through to this plateau, this rare and longed for invitation, dinner with friends. Not round a fire, not plates on knees, not cold, not distant, not imaginary, but at the table together, close enough to hold each other's hands, and why not? bearing gifts like amulets, trepidation checked by giddiness, churned under the channel of their emergence, all momentum now, air current scissoring the last invisible strings. Opening, we called it, like the flowers we were eager green and ready for the ending.
This is a poem about September and the summer's end. And Nina, I'm thinking of your book. It's a very seasonal poem. Um, but you know, it still feels like September out there. Little sleep of September. Let me lie down in the pitch pine in the cricket cradle song after the cradle light extinguishes summer's resinous body. In the sound booth of winter, you will say wave, wave. You will say ear, ear. You will say sand, sand. You will say here, here. Little life is the same in each city, only our weather makes it more so. Let this be a poem of best intentions, the quilt we never made of the fabric of my father's time, the piece of legislation we failed to pass, reconciliation. Let it be sky light, swan song, wave length, knee cap, windfall, sunset, floodlight. I was also inspired by a visit to an autologist. Um, I don't know if people have ever gone, but an ear doctor, which is one of the oldest, oldest medical specialties. And they put you in this booth and they have you repeat these words. And it's just, it's a poet's dream. <laughs> they actually say, you will say and the word and then you repeat the word. Um, okay, I'm gonna read. Another summer, summerish poem from Fair Sun, which is the first book here. Let's see. How should we <clears throat> How should we live our lives? How should we live our lives? With love and trepidation, sign our letters. Conceive a child only after much forethought or none at all. Follow the dialectical heart to world's end and feel it tighten a muscle to fill again unfettered. Daughter, as you grow up, I will grow old, a fact that shocks you even at age three. Love has no part in this. Only the sea is free of such calculations and sometimes a person too running into the sea in late September when the water remembers just barely what it was to be cold. I'll read um, a poem about Armenia. As Fiona mentioned, my, my <clears throat> mother's side of the family is from Armenia. And this is about my time in Yerevan, which is the capital city. Yerevan, New York, Yerevan, New York. What to do with the five flies grazing this head of cheese or the texture of this carpet's blue, which is the weight of water on a cloudy day at Sevan Lake and the pattern of fish of dragons weaving the drowned and mythic together, what will save them? If not language, then a currency something hard that answers the cry at the marketplace? Why, if you say how beautiful, don't you buy it? Own it, and your tongue fumbles for coins in the dark change purse of your mouth. In a sketch by Dali, it's a closer look brings you eye to eye with a skull. Two larger grapes toward the cluster stem, forming sockets of the absent eyes. In the bone clean room of the museum, two grapes grow glaucous with a powdery bloom of ripeness, rounding with the pleasure of a riddle. Somewhere green, a man tucks with a shepherd's crook a tendril into the woven roof of grapevines outside his door. Neighboring, I watch, but he stands in the dappled suns of his living roof, holding his crozier wearing a cape of light. A man is speaking as, a man is pouring water from a pail. A man is speaking as though pouring water from a pail. 
He is too far for me to understand him, his meaning flashing and reflecting, a shadow tossed by the sun back at me. But I recognize the sound of the rushing, the mass of it hitting the ground, the bright white sound of it. Um, let's see, I think, I think I'll move on to <clears throat> Geode, which was published in, um, was it April, April of 2020. So as, as uh, Nina and I were just talking about, all three of us actually, it was so strange to have books come out then, and uh, this is the first time I'm reading from it in person. So I think I'll read an excerpt. There's a there's several long poems in this book, and one of them is uh, titled River, and it's about the Colorado River and a court case that was brought against the state of Colorado by this environmental group to arguing that the river should be given standing, um, which means the same legal rights as a person would have. Um, basically, the, the river should be considered, um, although it's a natural object, a body in the way that a human body or a corporation is. And I was really inspired by this case. So I'll read a few pages from the beginning of this. It's too long to read in full. River. To save a river, you must give it standing. You must contain it in the words of a retainer who will plead that any confinement of his plaintiff in the courtroom will be inadequate to convey the real physical life of a 14 million acre feet river flowing from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific. But he will endeavor nevertheless to bring his case for the relief of the Colorado before the judge on this day, the 26th of September, 2017. He will start at the very beginning with science, the attraction between hydrogen and oxygen, then poetry, water dancing as vapor on the wind. Geography will help him to locate the headwaters in La Poudre Pass, and history, the diversions of its delta by dams and irrigation. Then he will catalog selectively its dependents, many endangered, the humpback chub, the Colorado pike minnow, the razorback sucker, the bony tail Gila elegans, known for its elegant swimming, also called broom tail, when it existed in the wild for how easily it could be caught by hand. Hot Creek pebble snail, Moapa pebble snail, Pan Regat pebble snail, Grand Wash spring snail, Overton asimania, stay with me now. The spruce fir, pinyon juniper, cottonwood willow forests, stay with me now. Thurber's fescue, tufted hair grass, blue joint grass, stay with me now. Willow cars, scrublands, saltbush greasewood basins, stay with me now. Beavers, river otters, muskrats, stay with me now. Bald eagle, greater sage grouse, gunnison sage grouse, peregrine falcon, yellow-billed cuckoo, summer tanager, southwestern willow flycatcher, stay with me now. Butterflies, 139 species alone in Rocky Mountain Park, stay with me now. The Colorado River toad, the lowland leopard frog, the relic leper leopard frog, stay with me now. Elk, mule deer, bighorn sheep, stay with me now. Gray wolf, grizzly bear, black bear, mountain lion, coyote, lynx, stay with me now. Cropland, close to 4 million acres, human beings, close to 40 million. Is it by virtue of this immense life-giving labor that the river is not a rights holder, but a natural object meant for profit, like slaves, like women, an order apart, like the roe and the deer? Unthinkable once that a river should have rights, though men have been making persons of ships, of church and state for centuries, legal fictions, unthinkable still, ridiculous for a river. As for women, this simile in a first year property casebook, copyright 1968, 
now in its fourth edition, quote, after all land, like woman, was meant to be possessed, unquote. What rights do I, a woman at sea level, have to this high country river? In court, I would be found remote. The river is not my property. I do not possess it. I have only stood on a bridge far above it and seen its silent green line cutting through layers of deep time. I have floated easy forward in its swift stretches, fought hard forward in the rapids. I've submerged my body in its cold, clear waters and in the unlikely aquamarines of a tributary, it has quenched my thirst and cooled my blood and cleaned the dirt from my body. I've lost all sense of human time in this river. And long before my recent reacquaintance with it, I wondered, barely adult, at one of its antecedents, barely a stream, which straddled the continental divide where I stood and flowed in two directions at once. I am not a dependent of the, of the river, nor a descendant. It has been more of a godparent. No, not even that. I am not of the states to whom the water has belonged for a hundred years, not from Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, Wyoming, Nevada, Arizona, California. Neither am I of the people left out of the language of a compact that apportioned the river between the seven states in 1922, the people of the basin tribes whose claims to the water antedate any others. Still, it is a relation in feeling. So I'll stop with that one. Thank you. Um, and maybe if I have time for one more new poem that was just published today. So I'm excited to read it. For the growers and the grocers, on my walk around the reservoir, I was thinking it won't get any easier, but the ease in my body as I thought this thought on the first day of the last month of a long constricted year, breathing the sweet spice of the dead wet leaves and grasses, some standing, some matted in a circle as if a deer had bedded down there overnight, thinking if we could see the rain as rain, knowing full well the science, the pain as pain, knowing full well the politics. I wanted to say that after they stopped trying to kill my grandfather, he grew up and became my grandfather. Two different people, outside and inside. Outside, he had the gift of beautiful neutrality. He wasn't stuck in some pathetic fallacy, but was rooted in the dirt, a gardener and a walker attuned to weather. He forgot himself. Inside, he sat in his camel-colored recliner and inhabited a stronghold within the greater republic of organized forgetting. How he survived was fate, but how he lived was bifurcation, like his trees, his quince and peaches. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, that was beautiful. The next person reading for us is Nina McLaughlin. Nina McLaughlin believes that we all have stories buried inside of us, that there is some foundational mythology that exists inside of us all, whether we know it yet or not. And for her, these stories were drawn out by stories that we all know quite well, Greek mythology and classics. Her own book, Wake Siren, began as a writing exercise, challenging herself to rewrite one of Ovid's myths from a different perspective. What followed was a book that told these stories in a very real and raw way, how we've never heard them before. Her first book was the acclaimed memoir, Hammerhead, The Making of a Carpenter, formerly an editor at the Boston Phoenix. And she has worked for nine years as a carpenter and is now a book columnist for the Boston Globe. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to all of the Grolier. Um, and 
to all of you who are here, this is also my first time reading um, since the pandemic. Um, and it's a particular honor to be reading both with Susan and Karen um, because, and also to be reading here because I'm not, I'm not a poet. And so I, I sort of feel like I'm, I'm sneaking in here um, and, and feel grateful and honored to be part of it. Um, I'm gonna be reading tonight from um, this book called Summer Solstice, which is an essay, uh, which is sort of an ode to summer um, that came out in, yeah, April, 2020 from Black Sparrow Press. Um, and uh, I'm gonna read from the sort of, a, the sort of towards the end of it. And it's about um, killing, killing fruit flies. Um, <laughs> Uh, the section is called A Last Tremble of the Wing. I have murdered generations of fruit flies in my kitchen. They arrive in July once the heat has settled in and for the warmer weeks of the year, we, re re we begrudge each other's presence. I wash heads of lettuce in the sink, run a knife through fat tomatoes so they bleed on the cutting board, move a beer from fridge to freezer for 10 minutes, then pour it in a glass that sweats like I do and the fruit flies drift about for all of it. They flit about the peaches in the wooden fruit bowl in the counter of my small apartment near the river in the city. They land and rise and land on the soft down surface. I watch, wave my hand over the fruit, say, come on guys, go away. They scatter, tickle the private part of my wrist, touch my skin like secrets I'm not sure I wanna know. They wait a minute, land themselves on cabinet doors, wings sinkward, then drift again back toward the sugar juice below the peach fuzz skin. They do not touch down on the onions or garlic bulbs or the hot peppers drying in the basket that hangs from the window trim. The sweet flesh pulls them. Do they suck the juice, I wonder? Lick the sweet off their what? Paws, fingers, feet, microscopic suction cuppers go away, I say. They don't go away. They multiply, which is summer's mode to increase, burst forth, bloom. I tell you now, I've never liked it. How easy it is for me to get warm and stay warm in winter. How sharp and alive my mind feels in the cold. To see bare skeleton trees against the purple blue gloam in November, best, give it to me all year. Summer comes and it's as though the maze ridges on the surface of my brain melt and I am left with a smoothed out, mostly useless mass of gray pink meat matter underneath my skull. Heat stunned, dull and damp with sweat or about to be. In cold, one can always put on more clothes. In thick heat, there's only so naked we can get. I try not to fight it anymore. I embrace the sweat the damp at my back, between my breasts, the insect tickle of a drop riding the slide between the muscles that line my spine. Summer is for bodies near naked on the shore, bare calves, thighs, shoulders, but my body likes the cold dark half of the year so much more, that friction, when the heat comes from the inside, when we make the heat ourselves. And so, unlike the fruit flies, Unlike the rhododendrons, the honeysuckles, the peonies, the turtles, the bears, the dahlias, the daisies, the tulips, and the corn, I go dormant in the summer, slink into a sort of hibernation. Let's talk again like August when we really start to notice less light and the shadows start to shift. And let's keep talking in September and October and especially in November. And then in the crystalline sobriety of January and even February too, longest month of the year when the cold gray starts to weigh. And you, what section of the year do you like best? When do you come into your fullest sense of self? What season feels like home to you? Let's loosen the boundaries. Let's get unstrict with the regular definitions. Summer allows for it after all, a little looser, a little more unbound. For example, my favorite season of the year, October 13th through January 31st. A little longer than the seasons we know, the deepening of late fall into early winter. That's the, that's the time that comes to my mind when we hit the summer solstice. Because from here on, after this last long blaze of day, the days get shorter. It's chemical. I am seasonally affected. 
we all are. I don't begrudge the summer lovers and over time have come to better appreciate summer's moist and verdant charms. Swimming is good. Hot dogs off the grill are good. All the colors of the petals, deep and pale, riding a bike through the city on a warm night, slugs leaving their slick and shining trails on the sidewalks in the mornings, open windows, thunderstorms, it's nice to live. Each season has its own topography, each month. Pablo Neruda writes, green was the silence, wet was the light, the month of June trembled like a butterfly. June verges, it shifts, and it holds two forces at once, the start of summer, the start of the darkening. Press a flower crown upon your skull, get pressed into a bed of pine needles, dew moist in the morning, body moist on the bed, and the fruit flies seem to rise out of immaculate conception from the peach pits and the watermelon rinds and the green ribbons of cucumber peel slopped together in the compost bin so that opening the lid to dispose of more organic summer matter is to have Pandoric deja vu, evils emerging not as ashy demons, but as tiny flies that suck sweet, mate, and die. Summer slaughterer, I murder them. I pour old wine into a glass, a bottle of cheap white that's been rattling on the door of the fridge for months, unfinished red gone sour and cidery in the low cabinet by the window, pour a glass full of it, and then squeeze into the wine a stream of dish soap, which sinks like a snake to the bottom. A quick swish to move the soap around and the glass goes near the fruits in the bowl. The flies like the wine. They smell the sugar and approach the rim. It's irresistible. They're, they're drawn by the promise of a sweet feed without end. They hover and land on the lip. Then they dive in, one, another, another, the slick of the soap, it alters the surface tension of the wine so that once in, once they touch, there is no lifting up and out again. They soak on the surface and then they sink, absorbed into this countertop abyss. Dropping drunk, they drown. Their bodies collect at the bottom like the fleck dregs of a torn tea bag and I pour them down the sink drain with a pang Lives, after all, small lives, gone and done, and a soapy, boozy smell rises from the drain. More will come, and more again, as long as it's warm, as long as summer continues to ripen life, firm to sweet, to rot. And I like to think it's a nice end for them, of all possible ends. Loose, warm, wet, a tipsy grin, a last tremble of the wing, a summer fate, a sweet smell, a plunge, fast as that, and then the dark. Thanks. Hi, thank you, that was great. Um, the last person I'll be reading for us is Karen McCaden. Karen McCaden's poetry has a very distinctive existence. She writes right along this line of loss, grief, pain, and survival. This line that she writes helps us to navigate through experiences that we tend to leave unspoken while she shines a light on them. Karen McCaden's new book, American Wake, explores departure in many manners. Death, grief, apologies, families, in such a way that it slows them down and helps us to process and understand. Karen's first book, Landscape with Plywood Silhouettes, is the winner of the 2015 Vermont Book Award and the 2013 New Issues Poetry Prize. She's a graduate of the MFA program for writers at the Warren Wilson College, and now teaches English and creative writing at the Montpelier High School in Montpelier, Vermont. Hi everyone. Hi everyone online as well. Thank you for that gracious introduction and such a pleasure to read you too. And um, thank you all for coming and thank you for having all of us. This is such a wonderful occasion. I was, um, the first reading I did after the pandemic was a couple weeks ago and my voice started shaking because I was feeling really emotional. 
and I'd never had my voice shake at a reading in my life. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it's uh, just, just, I guess I'm just saying that because it's, it's powerful to be back um, in this space with people. Um, I, this book, American Wake, um, has a number of threads in it. It's got, uh, but all of them are tied by the idea of the ruination of homes and how homes can be broken and rebuilt. And I'm going to read from the thread that's about going back to Ireland. I was raised, I'm a second generation American and um, was raised with my, you know, very close to my grandparents who lived in Somerville. So I grew up in this area and um, I never knew where we came from and I was really interested in it. And in my 40s, I found my family overseas. So this, a lot of the poems are circling around that quest. Um, this first poem is Our House Behind the Hawthorns. And can you all hear me okay? okay great. Our House Behind the Hawthorns. Up the lane, each house abandoned longer ago is deeper in bog moss and lichen. Our house is just stone walls, a box filled with rusted bed frames and plows. 11 children, two benches, a plank table, work and hall, kettle and hook, stick broom, dirt floor, turf light. At night, tiptoe the edges of 13 people sleeping. Come morning, the clouds are what moves, the magpie flashing like it is not afraid. The sheep say their words with their heads low as if they know a story is a sacrament. What I came to learn Boxes have ways of folding that children can't know. The man I called, oh goodness sakes, would tell me nothing. Signed the short song of his name with an X. Whenever I would go to my grandparents' house, my grandfather would come to the front door and he would say, in his beautiful accent, which I can't do, <clears throat> for goodness sakes, would you look who's here? So I called him, <laughs> oh goodness sakes, all the years I knew him. In Legany, Donegal. My little grand aunt had no coat and it lashed rain in March on the way to school. And the schoolmaster at Four Masters saw her trouble and sent her to stand by the fire. And the cold little girl in the west wet dress stood too long and dried the rain and caught fire. Everyone running and patting her out. The degree of burns, not anything that survives in this story. No other details, just the rain, no coat, the teacher, the fire padded out, the girl gone home to bed, the girl, the pain. And it was back then, so she died just like the Cooper's wife gone missing, or the woman who was burned in a pile of tires down the road a century later. Gone, a fire, no cleansing, and nothing to do after, but almost get lost in time. A woman I visit saying, no, I don't know anything about your family. No, wait, I do. Just realized I never set any notion of a timer at all. I just read all night. Joke. You walk into a bar, look at the TV. Benedict is stepping down. Say to your friend, no Pope. Friend says, no Pope radio and laughs. Other people laugh too. Worst nightmare, a joke you don't get. Pretend you get it, later look it up. Absurdist humor from the 40s, two elephants in a bathtub. One asks for soap, the other says, no soap, radio. In the 40s, your father learned the butt end of a joke was Italian. Their thumbs on market scales in the North End, your father's father flicking his hand at them to back away the competition. Who might beat him to the docks, houses to paint, your father's father lugging step ladders and paint buckets on city buses. A joke was a way to kill a man who was after your living, not a luxury of soap and elephants. You know who you are from what you understand. A joke, a place to hide, a suburban neighborhood where your white skin hides your immigrant family, where a joke is no luxury of absurdist landscapes, clocks melting, dripping, or men standing around wondering whether to hang themselves, waiting for their God. People begged for work in your landscape in other people's homes and kitchens, in shipyards, cargo piled to load, men with arms like masts, people with no idea how letters worked, fled to this country where other people built words out of them, worlds out of them, out of what you could not understand. I'll read this little poem. 
And since I'm talking about my grandfather, um, it's called Longshoreman. Shoulder to the barrel, weather sturdy, the taste of the word wheelbarrow when you ask to borrow your neighbors because you don't have one. See also rigor, force power, force of will against the barrel's will to object. Longshoreman, a thing to holler from deck, to put men in line on shore. A long shore, men, shape up, a thing to do to get hired, to wait in a clump in the morning to be hired. Pie caps snapped, rolled, pocketed. Sweaters, wool pants, skin weather red, breath a kind of exhaust, a crowd of chimneys craning above morning, a palette of grandfathers. The ships exhaling, inhaling men and goods, their voices threading through foghorns and rigging, clanging like unregulated brokers, their eyes giving a go at the classifieds after work in an easy chair, grandmother in her chair nearby, negotiates sling loads, deal and dry goods, tally pallets, rope the stacks in place, hold steady sheaves and sheaths, lock down goods in the ship's belly. This is a poem I wrote um, was with a friend on, um, in the Aran Islands on Inishir. It's called Nine White Deer. The sea forgives nothing on Inishir, though I think it might, outnumbered as we are by stones and bees, the Campanula suggesting stay, playing their purple bells in the wind. The cell and church stand open to the sky like mouths, and what might be square tombs show their backs. Gobnet ran from her family's fighting to live here in a stone cell, no bigger than a rowboat and underground next to her church. A church so small, we think it's a ruined cottage at first, barely legible in the grass beside it, the stone outline of another room where the coffee and donuts were served, we laugh, shushed by a woman who points through the narrow door at a priest in white robes, his arms up as if to hold the sky, the church roof gone. We stand with our palms to the stones and listen, feeling the thinness, eyes welling. We are waved in, given a book, sound out words in Breton, and guess the melody of her. Our textbook French barely a guide, not even the carline thistles gold readying us for the communion we take, the wine we share across time. Halfway back in time until Christ, a vision told Gobnet to leave this place not to settle until she found a herd of nine white deer. There she would find her resurrection place. I know how tired she must have been. A double hawthorn tree stands like a mother at the top of the meadow. Shark fins and bird bones hung from her branches, skulls tucked in her elbows. I leave a shell at her feet with a prayer for my family, walk out past a square white stone covered in moss and broken shells where the birds break snails for their meat. This poem is called Forgetting. One of the things I really love in Ireland is the birds are all different than what they are here. It's, it's an island, island um, you know, evolution. And they all, some of them have similar names, but they just don't look the same. The robin doesn't look the same. And I love the crows. I love the magpies, even, I think people there find them annoying, but I find them so beautiful. Um, they have a whole big long thing about magpies, but the hooded crow I thought was really beautiful. Um, they're brown and black and they look like they're wearing a hood, but I just think that they're really lovely and kind of somber um, when you see them in the landscape. Um, this is one of the poems I wrote in Donegal. And so I was able to, um, when I go to Ireland now, I stay on my grandfather's farm, which is really, an incredible gift. So a bunch of these poems are written there. I'll read this one and then one about um, my cousin likes to go to a holy well when I stay with him. So we get on the quad and go out into the forest and go to a holy well. So. Forgetting. Forgetting a day, days, feels like learning how to see, how the hooded crow at first can't be seen, but scatters at the sound of footsteps, sudden, like flying boats headed nowhere. Seen landing together nowhere on the mountain that has no name on any map. I am learning in the slow way I made my way back here to where I'm from, 
to think about my bones the same way Ruth Stone thought about hers. Here's what happened today, or what I can remember. A man said I could murder a cup of tea when he walked in from the sheep and the rain. I made tea the same color as the river falling through the rhododendron. Let us let go of stories, learn to see but not remember. In half or less of my life, none of this will remember me at all. And this is um, <clears throat> Coletta Forest. The, the farm is on the border with Northern Ireland. And so there's a, a great expanse of places where, like roadways where houses, um, the further you go up the road, as I mentioned in another poem, the fewer houses there are because they all would be, the further from town, the more likely they would have fallen to ruin because people couldn't get what they needed and various other reasons. So um, the, the forest along the border is really beautiful and strange. Coletta Forest, Father McLaughlin's well. We cut through the forest to check the sheep on the far mountain and stop to fill our bottles. Sitka spruce make a grid filled with moss. Above the holy water, on a shelf, this shrine. Baby toys, wrappers of pills, prayer cards. Star Wars posters, Jesus, his beard chipped, pointing to his flaming heart. Next to him, another Jesus, broken ankles, alabaster, hollow and full of leaves, a hole clear through his chest. Baby dolls, a cane, and face down there, another Jesus slumped beside the shotgun shells, packs of cigarettes, snow globes. Near inhalers and Hello Kitty and zipped baggies of jewelry and charms, another Jesus, hands open. We kneel to bless ourselves. Midges worry the air until they find us. Nearby, in the asphodel in the wet ditch, horse bones almost clean, look like what I think I am underneath. I think I can read two more poems. Um, yeah. Shaking the sheets. And um, so the mountain that the farm is underneath is actually called Krishnamil. And it means, um, it means like, what does it mean? It means stack of, stack of midges and whales. And it's got this strange <laughs> set of, of connotations, but it's a, um, sort of a mountain, more of a hill. Shaking the sheets. The rain skims Kirk Namil in visible waves until it's my ghost aunt shaking the sheets to smooth them, though she knows already that she is getting nowhere. I make tea and stay in, the collie running in his sleep on the linoleum. I let the days waste away as if I have not come across the world to be here, as if I might ever know the difference between work and rest as if the woman whose house this was would not turn me away, as if I have found my place. I weigh what I thought against what I know. Let the morning disappear as if disappearances were kind, as if a windmill were some kind of measure. I stay until the fuchsia come and go in the hedge and rowan berries grow inside the ruined house. Some days I don't know what happened, by which I mean I don't know where the days have gone. At night I can't sleep, as if it is my turn to shake the sheets, as if I know more than I should, and she knows that I do. And this is the, the last poem in the book, and I'll close with this one. Home on Holiday in Lahi Village. A gas station clerk asks if I'm home on holiday, and he hears my accent, flat as a stone in me, gone as long as I've been, forever I'd say, if home were a place I had ever been before. When he tries my accent, dull as bone, then I think he knows what he means, as if home were a place I had been before. I am a map of work and names from way back when. I finally understand that he means I've been turned around. To find home, I worked my way back home, back from a map of names. I rent a house where I'm home already, bring what I found of me, what I thought was home in me, gone as long as I've been forever it seems. I rent a home where I'm home already, begin at the gas station. I told the clerk where I've been. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. This was great.
Um, so all of these books are available and you can buy them up at the front now after the reading. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I have a question for you. I'm um, curious as to why you wrote an essay about summer when you are admitting it to Lisa. Yeah. 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 Um, it was partly, um, I think the solstice itself is a very magical day, in part because that's the part where it starts to get darker, which I do feel excited for. Um, and I think it's that moment of the year when you're switching to that that descent into the darkness, yeah. um, which which does feel really uh, alive and exciting to me. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's funny. I, I think the writing it did help me appreciate the season a lot more, yeah. I will say. Um, but yeah, I was realizing as I was reading this, October 13th, I think was yesterday, yes. was my favorite season. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 I spent last night building a trap for fruit flowers at my house Amazing. in yes. the same way. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It really works. I it's I feel like my little uh, wine glass has gone much later into the season this year. Um, right. It has been it has been summer. So um, in your book, so we're coming to that island and you talk about why it's called titled American Weight, but then it also gave me incredibly homesick. Oh, <laughs> oh yes. Yes. Like, that of this <laughs> yeah, So um, an American Weight is the, um, I probably should have said this at the beginning, it's uh, the the night before someone would leave for America, they would have a wake for the, for the immigrant and um, they would celebrate them and they would have, like have a keener come and cry for the family and the village would come, stay up all night long and um, party like they lost somebody because they were losing somebody, right? So this idea of um, eulogizing the living. So my grandparents both would have had one um, in the 1920s and they left. So um, the book's also about losing my brother um, to addiction and um, it's about um, those kinds of losses, like what we lose in, in, in coming to new countries. And it, um, yeah. There's more, I think there's more to that answer, but yeah. It's powerful to me to think about um, loving and celebrating and losing at the same time. Susan, I actually have a question for you. Um, it was, I had read your book and um, had read Geode and that we were poem was really, it was amazing, yeah. um, really an incredible thing to read. And it was extremely cool to hear you read it and to hear that stay with me repeated, like really could sort of feel that. Um, and I guess what I'm curious, how did you find out about this case? How was this, how did you come to know about? It, you know, it was, thank you. Um, it was in the Times, there was an article about the case being brought. Um, you know, before it was the court, and then they kind of tracked it through. And I, I, you know, will often actually literally clip out Ooh. articles and put them in the file that I'm working on. And this, um, you know, just it, it uh, I accumulated so much, um, and it felt like it could be an essay, but then it ended up being this long narrative poem. Um, so there, a lot of it um, was inspired by the other legal research. Mm -hmm. um, there are articles about should trees have standing that was a famous, wow. um, a famous law review article. And um, so there's a lot of quotation to uh, and uh, research that is incorporated in the book. But yeah, it's good that times yeah. recording. That's really neat. <laughs> you also sounded like you would spent time on it. I had spent time yeah, on it. Yeah, I was a lot of time on it. I mean, yeah, it was quite. I love how the, the repeated phrase stay with me was both like asking the audience to stay with mm -hmm. you through this long list, but also like asking these things to stay with you. Mm -hmm. I just 
I think that was such a moving thing to keep hearing. It kept making me feel more moving. That was my fact. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's hard to read those long litanies, right? Without mm -hmm. the, the refrain being easier to read aloud. Too. Yeah. What happened in the game? Well, the, it was it was eventually dismissed altogether. It was considered invalid. Um, but there are other cases where rivers around the world, I think in the U.S. as well, I've forgotten now, have have gotten standing and um, and are considered. Um, are considered persons. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, you know, I think it was, I don't think they ever expected to win, but it was important to, to start there. Mm -hmm. And the poem ends with the piece being closed. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 I personally just want to thank all three of you for this little trip to Ireland. It was wonderful. That was you're going back. Ireland is so much a part of Boston, you know, the hunting community is so much a part. And then all the connections with nature, mm -hmm. you know, with the fruit flies and the river and the, you know, I just it was really beautiful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> I think the poets will sign some books over here. And we like. We've got some water, too, if anyone's thirsty. Um, yeah, no. Just a